I've been asking for smoke my entire fucking career. But if you First time love I've got him, it. you forgive him. No, no, you're not real. Oh, you're real too. Okay, fine. Well, hello. I was going to say it's my first, pub my first post-scandal public appearance, but that's always true. <laughs> all right, all right, let's do it. Should I speak through both of them? Who knows? Nobody knows. All right. <laughs> Excuse me, this is a very professional operation. <laughs> Many minutes went into planning this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's not the first thing of its dimensions that have been down there. Um, <laughs> Happy Friday the 13th, and I hope you are suitably spooked. Because the next 30 minutes are going to be genuinely scary. Special thanks to Nestle Crunch, who are sponsoring my talk this evening. They're not. Um, <laughs> but Nestle is giving me so much free publicity in Australia, I had no choice but to thank them. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this. Mark Latham is an American uh, blogger and media personality. And he's advertising my upcoming uh, speech dates in Australia with a, with a Photoshop. Uh, have you ever heard of this Milo chocolate milk? Almost as delicious as the real thing. And... <laughs> No, when I want hot chocolate, I just roll over and ask nicely. Uh, <laughs> but he's, he's advertising my Australian tour dates with a Photoshop of Milo chocolate milk with my face on it and asked by some scurrilous miscreant from the press whether they were endorsing this advertisement. Nestle said no, and they didn't just say no, they said we're investigating legal options. As with the Washington DC Metro Authority, apparently my face is a hate crime. <laughs> Which tells you just how far America has fallen. Um, <laughs> all right, well I just had to thank them. Um, and I'm going, I obviously just to, just to set the record straight, and pay no attention to what's on the monitors. Is it on there? I'm sorry. I can't see, I don't know. Oh, yes, it is. Yes. Good. Yes, good, okay, fine. <laughs> good. Pay no attention to the monitors. Nestle has nothing to do with this talk, and it would be horrible and very unfortunate if any of my horrible, mean-spirited remarks were to be in any way associated with Nestle. <laughs> now, as a lover of theater, I thought long and hard about which outfit to wear this evening. I thought about the things that people traditionally wear at Halloween. The stuff, you know, that you, that you think of, the classic Halloween outfits, the stuff that immediately comes to mind when somebody says spooky or scary. I thought about Debbie Wasserman Schultz. <laughs> I thought about Rosie O'Donnell. I thought about George Clooney. But I realized I wasn't ugly enough. I even considered, at great personal risk, Maxine Waters. <laughs> but I'm only just getting back on my feet and I'm not sure I'd survive that one. <laughs> and that's a bit scary even for me. Eventually I settled on the person who inspires the most fear and loathing, the most terror and trepidation, the person who strikes, who strikes fear and, and, and monstrous horror into the, the, the hearts of most Americans in America. I came as myself. Yeah. If I don't win best costume, I'm going to throw the sort of temper tantrum that makes Alec Baldwin look like Natalie fucking Portman. <laughs> Speaking of porcine disappointments, Miss Elaine Lancaster, who hired a drag queen, expecting polish 
professionalism. For the record, I am delightfully fragrant down below, uh, as most of the Bronx and all of Compton can tell you. She thought she was introducing me, the poor dear. <laughs> Way above your pay grade, darling. Um, <laughs> no, we love her. We love her. We love her. We just, we just know not to hire drag queen. No, we do. No, we do. We do. We do. But I think that like a disturbing number of people in this room, perhaps she forgot to take her Geritol. I, well, no, I, I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to be rude, but I do normally play to 20-year-olds. Um, looking around the room this evening, the person to pacemaker ratio. It's very disturbing. <laughs> it's a good job my eyesight is so bad or I would be adding to the Halloween horrors with my own interpretation of that scene in The Exorcist. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this, the, the last time this many old people gathered in Florida, there was a line for the stair lifts spreading down to Key West. <laughs> Turns out it was just a Jeb Bush fundraiser. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure none of you were there. None of you were there. Now, about my eyesight. <laughs> There's something to be addressed. An elephant in the room. I know what you're all thinking. I know you've all read it. You've all seen it. You've all got questions. And I want to address them in full. I want to set the record straight. Because you are my beloved companions in the fight against political correctness. I owe it to you, to be honest, um, so I am going to tell you uh, the truth. Balmain, Dior, Dolce & Gabbana, <laughs> and La Croix. <sighs> it's Friday the 13th, we're skidding towards Halloween. What could be more frightening than some fetid BuzzFeed blogger trawling through 120,000 of her emails trying to dig up dirt? It's horrible, but at least, at least I had my sex tape moment. <laughs> Unfortunately for everyone in this room, there was no sex in it. Just a bunch of fat autistic racists trying to frame me as a white supremacist. <laughs> it's enough to make your flesh crawl. It's funny that lefties suddenly believe in publishing stolen emails. Good to know, good to know, uh, but I... <laughs> If you want to frame me as a white supremacist, you're going to have to do a lot better than that. And I can tell you that my black husband and I had a hearty laugh about the contents of that article right before he fucked me. <laughs> if I'm a white supremacist, I am the worst one in history. I'm as bad at racism as Hillary Clinton is at winning elections. <laughs> By the way, the wedding was lovely. Thank you for asking. 300 fucking grand. But, and only for 12 guests, by the way. 12 guests. Can you imagine being somebody invited to that wedding? You know, Four Seasons, Hawaii, Gucci head to toe. It was lovely. It was wonderful. But did I mention I married a black man? The author of this BuzzFeed piece, who will never work at the New York Times, is probably expecting me in this first public appearance since the article dropped to address some of the things in the piece that I think were unfair, unreasonable. I know, you know that people will have lingering questions and that's certainly what anybody in my position would be advised to do. Um, my response to that is, um, nah. <laughs> I'm going to do what's called pleading the Hillary. I have lots in common with Hillary Clinton, in fact. Um, you may not know this, but post-Haiti, uh, post I realize we have something in common. We both enjoy fucking blacks. <laughs> Neither of us has driven since 1998. <laughs> and we don't comment on stolen emails, so go fuck yourselves. 
They didn't make me, they can't break me, and the same goes for you. Uh, the media wants you to believe that all Trump supporters are racist, and that's the only way that I and Trump and Breitbart could possibly be popular. The only way we could be popular is by pandering to racists and to white supremacists, to dark racist instincts that lurk beneath the surface of every white person in America. It's a ludicrous proposition. It's a ridiculous right. proposition. And the way they come for you is via us. They want to take us out to imply something about everybody who voted for the current president. It is bullshit when they say it about me, and it is bullshit when they say it about you. What you're witnessing what you're witnessing is the implosion of identity politics. They will call gay people homophobic if it serves their purposes. They will call women misogynists. They will call black people racists and white supremacists. Uncle Tom's, thank you. I don't need help, but thanks. <laughs> they will... <laughs> Why do they do this? Well, they do this because we hold different political positions from theirs. And their, their, their fabled coalition of the minorities falls apart when some of those minorities go rogue and shock horror become libertarians or republicans. Well, I'm sorry, but this is the face of the future, so get fucking used to it. We... Because we believe in liberty, freedom of expression, and limited government. We think that people should be able to say, do, and B, whatever they want, regardless of skin color, orientation, and sex. We believe that actions matter more than words. We do not believe that comedians should have their jokes censored, and we don't like the idea of college professors, bloggers, or government apparatchiks deciding what language we can use and what subjects we are allowed to talk about. Fuck that. We don't think science is racist, although it can sometimes challenge our preconceptions. We don't think critical thinking, logic, and history are tools of patriarchal oppression leveraged to... <sighs> they believe this shit, they really do. <laughs> Leverage to suppress the rights of women and gays. We care more about facts than feelings. Because although, we know that although you can force somebody to say they agree with you in public, you can force somebody to say the right things to save their jobs or to have an easy life. You can't change how people think. And all that you do is, is build up resentment and hatred uh, and frustration, which is, of course, what Trump's election was an example of. So, by the way, was the success of my New York Times bestselling book, which we're here this evening to celebrate. It's available, it's available in all good bookstores, even Barnes & Noble. Um, my, no, st oh, stop, we like them now. We, li we like them, I know, I know people in this room did great work, some of it was published and some of it wasn't. Uh, to <laughs> Actually, my, my chief revenue officer is in here, um, I can't really say any more than that, but we love Barnes & Noble and we're very happy for stuff. Um, <laughs> The oppressive establishment left wants to stir up racial hatred and division in this country while pretending to be on the side of equality. But we see them for what they are now. We know what they are. Their decades of cultural rule are coming to an end. The next 30 years is going to be about freedom and fun. The next 30 years is going to be about laughter and war. The next 30 years is going to be an explosion of free speech, of libertarianism, and of joyfulness in the face of the stultifying police, uh, a police state speech codes, and school marmish crayon rearranging of the progressive left. We're winning. Now I think, I think it's time to put Nestle out of their misery. Um, with that nonsense out of the way, let's talk about Harvey Weinstein. I would love to. He's the biggest name in the news in the past couple of weeks, aside from me, of course. Worthy, a horror worthy of any Halloween flick by Eli Roth. Now, conservatives have always wondered why the left virtue signals so much, why they're constantly advertising their own moral virtue, why they're desperate to advertise their own goodness. Well, it's my observation that, expressive, uh, that, that aggressive public displays of virtue are where the truly morally deplorable hide. Yeah, 
Has there been a better example of this than the media's implied juxtaposition of me with Harvey Weinstein? As you know, I hate attention. <laughs> what? But it's interesting to see some of the think pieces come out, and um, I think it's instructive to consider it. I am here, a gay Jewish immigrant who cracks fat jokes with a black husband and who sticks up for middle America to defend Western civilization. Now, I'm not a victim, so I don't whine about the fact that the press calls me a white nationalist, a white supremacist, a sexist, a racist, a homophobe, a transphobe. <gasps> On only transphobe is true. <laughs> I mean, come on. Aren't we all? And I say this as a man with six inches of makeup and two cans of hairspray on. They're terrifying. People always go quiet at the tranny jokes. You have been conditioned by Time Magazine, by Time Magazine, by Glamour, just because you like Orange is the New Black, you suddenly think that, that, that the left should be able to, to instill moral decision-making on medical issues. You see? It's wrong. It's wrong, but let's be kind to our sexually confused cross-dressing brothers, sisters, and... Thank you. And whatever else, because... Because when you're trans, every day is Halloween. <laughs> you know... October 31st is the day they show up to work dressed like a normal person. <laughs> Me... Meanwhile, Harvey Weinstein, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get back on track. Meanwhile, Harvey Weinstein is out to make fat stacks of cash while raping young women. And the venerable but decaying Meryl Streep. She doesn't need to dress up, does she? Um, calls him a god. Uh, speaking of gag reflexes, uh, Let's take a moment to pay respects to Harvey Weinstein's victims. Too much? No, good, okay. Especially, thank you. Especially the ones who have come forward. These women have stood up to the Hollywood Democrat machine and they've done so not at great personal risk because the ones who have done it are largely ones whose careers are on the decline. Um, I'll get to that later. Uh, but they have done it at some personal and professional risk. Ashley Judd, who invited Harvey to watch him shower. Can you imagine anything worse than watching Wein uh, Weinstein shower? Yes. Aside from sex with Ted Cruz? <laughs> it's my job to think about these things. <laughs> Rose McGowan. She's enjoying herself a little bit too much, don't you think? I mean, there's a difference between being a victim and parading your victimhood. And I wonder whether she wouldn't have been more sympathetic if she'd simply stated the facts. She does seem to be having a bit too much fun with it. I probably shouldn't say that, but... She did get suspended from Twitter for tweeting about Harvey, um, who paid her off over allegations he did something to her in a hotel room. Asia Argento, who I'd never heard of before, but I'm sure she's important and interesting and beautiful. Um, she apparently, f uh, she had Harvey forced oral sex upon her, um, which incidentally is another Halloween, ca uh, not Halloween, another Halloween costume I rejected. Um, <laughs> don't believe what they say. Yogurt doesn't dry correctly. It doesn't. It just, just it, it doesn't look right. I had a couple of. <laughs> I tried, nothing worked. <laughs> Listen, I know you're all planning uh, Lewinsky outfits for Halloween, so don't try to lie, okay? This is, you, you're, you're, you're going quiet now, and, you're, and you're, go, you're hushing at the back, but this is useful information. You're gonna just have to ask your husband to help you out. Mira Sorvino, whom he gave his creepy fat guy massage to, the Harvey Handling. 
And dear sweet Angelina Jolie. She got the Harvey treatment as a young actress. Now I know she's... <laughs> Somebody finds it even funnier than I do. <laughs> now I know she's been through the Harvey process, so I'm prepared to forgive her not just her drug addiction or her Benetton catalog inspired adoption strategy. <laughs> Who am I to complain after all? But even her marriage to Brad Pitt. Uh, my heart goes out to anyone who looks the other way by being diddled by that quivering mound of flesh. I'm sure you've all been watching the delays from other A-listers, by the way, who refused to condemn Weinstein until it was clear that it would damage their careers, careers they protected by protecting him. These fragrant creatures might be beautiful on the outside, but they are dark and ugly on the inside, including the people who are now rounding on him. Why? Because they knew. In some cases, they knew for decades. And they're coming out, now it's safe. They're coming out, now they have the cover of other celebrities. They're coming out, now there is a critical mass. They deserve no applause. They deserve no encouragement. They deserve for their careers to have stains on them as dark and as indelible as the stains on their souls. The feminists are at home, staying silent, collecting their checks. Wearing their pussy hats. I don't object to them on ideological grounds as much as I do stylistic. You're, you're privileged this evening, thank you. You're privileged this evening to have two headline speakers who understand fashion. And let me tell you, by far the worst offense was the look of them. The real monsters in America today um, are not us. They're not those on the side of freedom. Um, they are the degenerate elites of Hollywood, the media, the academy. They preach tolerance, equality, and respect while raping, stealing, lying, and destroying the very foundations of this country that I have come to love so much. This is the greatest country in the history of human civilization. And I'll repeat, as some of you know, I have a little insight into this. I lived in Beverly Hills in 2008, because of course I did. Um, <laughs> I was a tech journalist. I was writing about privacy and piracy and, and various other things. And I lived um, on the corner of Mulholland and Laurel Canyon. It's about as deep into Hollywood royalty territory as you can get. Um, and I, I heard things. I didn't ever see anything. Um, I never met Harvey Weinstein. But I heard things too. And I can tell you with absolute certainty, everyone knew. They all knew. Everyone who is telling you that they didn't know that they're surprised by this, are, they are lying to you. They're lying to you. I don't know about that, but... I opened my laptop one morning to find, um, after a house party, to find that Sandy Gallen had used it to book a, a gay male prostitute. Well, I'm glad he's dead. Hollywood is a horrible place, and I left it very quickly. But you don't have to just believe me. SNL satirized this almost, a, was it a decade ago? Yeah. Made jokes about Weinstein? And it was in, in award ceremonies too. And if you watch Return of the Jedi, you can clearly see Harvey Weinstein's influence in the scenes between <laughs> Leia and Jabba the Hutt. The clearest, it's the clearest indication we have that somebody in Hollywood knew what was going on. Just couldn't quite say it. Worse, perhaps, even the stars who waited a week to condemn Weinstein are the ones who are acting horrified and claiming this is a revelation to them. They knew. But it's not just actors circling the wagon for Weinstein. NBC executives sat on this story for a really long time, for years. They knew it was happening. And they didn't break this story despite the fact that it might save future victims from sexual assault and even rape. They killed the story. The one positive thing I can say about NBC journalists is that they were on the right end of the equation. They wanted to write this story. They wanted to break this story. And the executives killed it. We know this now beyond doubt. 
Now, I was told this would be a delicate audience tonight and that I shouldn't use the C word. I've used every word up to the C word. But as a free speech activist, <laughs> I'm loath to be controlled by speech codes, so I will use it. Clinton. <laughs> Harvey Weinstein was a prolific contributor to Hillary. His wrongdoing barely scratches the surface of the depravity in Hollywood, a subject I intend to write a lot more about in the coming years, in case you're wondering. The next time you hear, by the way, about somebody rich and famous and powerful in Hollywood doing despicable things, you can expect to hear the phrase Clinton Foundation quite soon afterwards. <laughs> Why won't he? Why won't he? Where's my wall? Why is she still free? What is he doing? Uh, when Uncle Steve left, I'm afraid, I have to tell you, when Uncle Steve left, I began to lose hope. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. Have you ever reached, by the way, into a freshly carved pumpkin to remove the seeds? With your hands, I mean. It is disgusting. The things I admit. Um, well, this is the thing. <laughs> this is the feeling Hillary Clinton gives me every time I see her on television. <laughs> that sort of mixture of ickiness, revulsion, and a question, why am I doing this to myself? Pumpkin guts Hillary would have been just as good as crooked Hillary. But if we're talking about scary monsters, of course, Secretary Clinton is more like Nosferatu. No matter how many times she gets beaten at the ballot box, the bitch just won't die. Now we have to endure a book tour. Heaven help us, and I mean that literally, uh, if the revelations about spirit cooking are anything to go by. We all know how closely lesbianism and witchcraft are related. We can, we can only pray. Um, it's hardly surprising, by the way, that it took Hillary so long to condemn Harvey. After all, what's she going to say? He's deplorable, he's disgusting, he's a rapist, he's an abuser, he's an exploiter of women. He's just like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey is indistinguishable from Bill Clinton, with, with one exception. He doesn't have a, a, an on-call hit squad to assassinate inconvenient whistleblowers. Which is presumably why Rose McGowan felt finally able to speak up. Speaking of whistleblowers. I'm sorry to be rude, by the way, but I don't honestly feel that sorry for Rose McGowan. It's, obviously, it's awful what happened to her, but she's very rich, very famous. It obviously didn't ruin her life, and she waited a really, really long time. And the way that you know that you don't have to feel too sorry for her is just check her Twitter feed. She's really enjoying it. She's really calling out Ben Affleck. I mean, you know, she's having the time of her life. Are you kidding me? <sighs> this self-righteous calling out routine. Why didn't she do it before? She waited to become rich and famous. The sins are Weinstein's. But the complicity ex extends to every mansion and every trailer in Hollywood, right up until someone sees more professional advantage in speaking out than in staying silent. <laughs> Compare this moral putrefaction with the supposed sins of our sitting president, who said something once in a trailer. And you start to understand liberal hypocrisy in the way that it ought to be appreciated, which is a focus on what is said instead of what is done. The words of conservatives, and this is how I get into so much trouble all the time. The word, and I don't care, and I'm gonna keep getting into trouble, and I don't give a shit. <laughs> the words of conservatives are considered far worse than the actions of progressives. You start to see the hypocrisy of the progressive left in full technicolor spooky vision. 
when you realize conservative speech is beyond the pale, but left-wing actions, whether sexual assault, corruption, violent protest, or murder, are excused. His name was Seth Rich. The, the left doesn't just, of course, accuse us of what they are themselves the most guilty of. The left accuses us of what we are victims of, which some of you will recall happened to me in February. The most depraved, sociopathic, vindictive, cruel, spiteful, and horrible thing to do to somebody is to accuse them of being an apologist for something they are, in fact, a victim of. This is part and parcel of being a conservative, part and parcel of being a libertarian in America today. And now everybody sees it. Now everybody knows. None of this matters to the ghoulish creatures on the left, and that is the real Halloween horror story. You have to ignore so many facts to paint a picture of most conservatives in the way that the media does. For instance, and just to give you one example, and I don't want to be defensive because, frankly, I don't give a shit what they write about me. <laughs> but to give you one example from February, um, of what they said about me in February, which you'll all remember. Well, 48 hours ago, a child rapist by the name of Chris Layden, who was 28 years old, was sentenced to seven years in prison in England as a direct result of my reporting. And this is just one. I don't want applause for it, because I'm just doing my job. Thank you anyway. <laughs> Two of his victims wrote to me today and said, have you seen this? And I said, yeah, of course I've seen it. I fucking did it. But the industry in which he worked stayed silent. The industry in which he worked said nothing. It's no surprise to you that it was the tech industry, the left-wing industry, that said nothing, that stayed quiet. And it was only through my reporting that the guy's uh, actions came to the widest possible audience, with the result that I think, it's all, I think all that stuff's gonna hit the press in England on Monday. I use myself as an example in this, not just because I'm an irredeemable egomaniac, though I am, <laughs> but because they visit this sociopathic hypocrisy on, in, to, to every public figure on the right, if they can, and they do it to you too. They do it to you for the crime of voting Republican. They do it to you for the crime of telling the wrong joke on Twitter. They do it to you for the crime of objecting to their stultifying speech codes. Not everyone in this room is Republican. Hopefully most of you. <laughs> or I won't sell very many books at the end of the evening. No, I'm kidding. Some of you are libertarians. Some of you are disaffected liberals. We welcome you. But they do it to everyone who steps outside the politically correct consensus. I noted, by the way, that Barack Obama's condemnation of Harvey Weinstein was a little stronger than Hillary's. Did you notice that? Apparently it takes a Clinton to make an Obama look good. Incidentally, I'm told Malia, Malia Obama did an internship at the Weinstein Company. Do you know that? Do you know that? Uh, heaven knows why, why Michelle was not particularly worried about her daughter, but then men can be pigs. Um, <laughs> Mich <laughs> Michelle Obama, the greatest Halloween costume in history. <laughs> She of course, she of course praised Harvey Weinstein at a, at a student film event. She said, quote, this is possible because of Harvey. He's a wonderful human being, a good friend, and just a powerhouse. And the fact that he and his team took the time to make this happen for all of you should say something not about me or about this place, but about all of you. Well, that's not a bromance, I don't know what is. <laughs> Presumably the reason Presumably the reason Weinstein couldn't speak himself is he's been banned from college campuses. <laughs> anyway, we shouldn't be so mean. We should have a let's, 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 let's lighten things up again a bit. And Chris Layden. We shouldn't be so mean on the former first lady for taking five days to respond to these allegations. I'd like to see you draft a timely comment of, what is it, four, three, four pages you on Twitter? goes on for fucking ever. All you've got to say is, this is bad shit and I hate it. But no, it goes on and on and on. You ever do the classic sign of a liar is, you, is they give you an explanation and they just keep talking. <laughs> they will not shut up. And you're like, okay, I heard you. I, oh, oh, okay, you're still going. <laughs> classic sign of, of lies. I'd like to see you, though, draft a timely comment, three pages long, when you're hit with seizures and coughing fits after every period. She's like an epileptic Blair Witch. <laughs> it's cr no, stop it. 
stop it. It's mean of us. It's cruel to expect any more from her. She's got far more important things to do in her retirement. Like scream and cry and work out who Chelsea's dad is. <laughs> Must have been hard for her turning on an old comrade like that. Harvey Weinstein, obsessed with money, power, and pussy. For Hillary, it's like looking in the mirror. Where do you, where, this is a great aspiration in life to find a job that you enjoy as much as, as, as much as I enjoy mine. I get paid for this shit. Right? When you take a step back from the horrors inflicted on these young women, the spectacle of progressivism imploding is delightful to behold. Witness, please, with me, the fall of Ben Affleck. Now known not as Batman, but as Buttman. That preening, self-satisfied blubber face now called out by his peers and scrambling to save the new Justice League movie. We've hit them where it hurts. Not in the pussy, but in the pocketbook. Yes. Whenever you hear somebody, by the way, and I'm not talking about Affleck specifically, my lawyers have asked me to say. <laughs> they asked me to say a lot else that I ignored this evening. When you hear somebody describe themselves as a male feminist, you can start the clock on the rape charge. <laughs> Normally three months. This is, this, is, this is, by the way, this is why progressive women think we're all rapists and sexists. They think we're all like progressive men. They think we're like the people they know. Now, to the reason we're all here. My book, Dangerous, um, what? No, I missed that. In my book, I describe the hypocrisy of Silicon Valley, the press, the entertainment industry, the academy, and yes, of course, in addition, establishment Republicans. Collectively, they represent the forces of darkness dedicated to ending the American dream and unraveling the Constitution. Now, this book is sold, I think we're cruising in the next month or two towards 200,000 copies across print and digital. And we have done, thank you. I don't know whether the record industry equivalent would be triple or quadruple platinum, because I don't keep track of things like that, but it's doing very well. And we've done it, by the way, without a single interview or a single review in the mainstream media. Imagine, imagine if I had this sort of dripping, obsequious, fawning coverage of a Lena Dunham or an Amy Schumer. We would have sold 10 million by now. But I'm not too raw about it because having been um, dropped, well, I am a little bit raw about it. Uh, having been dropped by Simon and Schuster, we've sold fewer, but the margins are better, so who knows. Uh, on balance, I think I probably lost a lot of money from there. Oh, actually, I'm going to talk, about you, talk to you a little bit about that. On balance, we probably lost a lot of money. By the way, you may have read that we only sold 152 copies in the UK. Does anybody know why? It wasn't on sale. That's the media for you folks. It wasn't on sale. 152 people wanted it so badly that they paid extortionate international shipping direct from the publisher to get a copy of a book that wasn't on sale in their country. And the media... Meanwhile, back home, we'd sold 100,000 of them. And the media's report is, Marionopolis sells 152 copies in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> I am delighted to tell you, incidentally, in case you haven't been paying close attention to me, in which case, fuck you, um, <laughs> that our lawsuit against Simon & Schuster is proceeding apace. Um, we are... I joke and I, and, I, and I try to make the best of the situation, but the reality is they broke a contract with us that cost us a lot of money and they have to pay for that. Um, the judge has wisely seen um, through their motion to dismiss the lawsuit 
which means that it will be proceeding to trial, and also we have the delicious prospect of discovery, which means that I get to find some of the lawyers in the room know what that means. Uh, it means that I get to see all the emails they sent about me to each other. I'm sure, I'm sure that that will prove that their decision was based solely and entirely on whether or not the manuscript was suitable for publication and absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the extraordinary pressure they were getting from the left and the boycotts from their own authors, which wasn't provided for in the contract, so they have to pay. They have to pay me a lot. And by the way, there's a... There's a, there's a um, God, I hate details. There's a... <laughs> I spent all this time doing my hair. I forgot to check up on the, case, the details of the case. No, I'm kidding. Um, someone else did my hair. Uh, no. there was, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. You just got to watch it. Uh, no, I don't know if I'm allowed. I'm going to get in trouble. Trouble. I'm going to say something more interesting. More interesting. And the more interesting thing is, it isn't just my uh, um, New York Times best-selling book. Um, the only good thing about the New York Times is that they allowed me to stay on their bestseller list for five weeks. Um, the, um, thank you. Uh, the, the, um, the good news that I have for you is not just that my book, which has been such a terrific success, um, is pub uh, has been published by my new uh, publishing imprint, Dangerous Books, but also that we have recently signed and we are about to publish Pamela Geller's new book, Fatwa. Yeah! None of the big five publishers would have allowed us to publish a book by a Jewish critic of jihad and political Islam called Fatwa. They would have insisted on a more politically correct title. They would have insisted on cuts, emendations, wording changes. We are proud to say we have... Uh, ed, uh, actually, the editor of the book is in the audience, uh, Chadwick, and uh, we are releasing her book unexpurgated as Pamela uh, you know, wrote it. And we are, we've given a fabulous photo shoot. The cover's stunning. I want to stab her in the throat. She looks so good. Um, <laughs> um, but the book is wonderful. It is, and I don't think she's going to mind me saying this, by far her best book. And she has always been a personal hero of mine. She is a, 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 an incredible warrior. She, you know, as, as, as if you, if you, a post 9-11, as you'll maybe remember if you're, if you're one of the older people in the room, um, which you all are. Um, <laughs> post 9-11, there were a lot of people who were worried about jihad, a lot of people who were worried about political Islam, but, but a lot of those freedom fighters dropped off and were left with David Horowitz, Robert Spencer, and, um, uh, and Pamela Geller. And Pamela Geller really has been um, an extraordinary force. She's the only person, well, let's, say, let's, be, let's be diplomatic. She joins a triumvirate, uh, me, Roger Stone, and Pamela Geller, the best dressed people in conservative politics. <laughs> Um, and she, which is the only real reason I signed the book. Um, no, but she's, she's, it's an absolutely wonderful thing, and I, ho I hope that you'll, um, I hope that you'll support it. It's out on the first of November. It's available for pre-order now. And if you know anything about, if you know anything about books, just go onto Amazon and just search for Pamela Fatwa. Um, <laughs> really, uh, I think you can. <laughs> Um, it's out 1st of November, but um, you, as anyone who knows anything about books um, will be aware, the, the, your initial position on the bestseller lists is determined entirely by your first week sales, and all the pre-sales go into the first week sales. So if you're, if you're at all interested in supporting her, it's 20 bucks, it's nothing. Um, so go, go and do that. The world has, um, by the way, more Milo in it every day, not just from the authors that we publish at Dangerous Books, um, but also some spectacular tour announcements that I have coming in November. So please look out for those. Um, I'm going to be back on the road, uh, back on the streets, as my team likes to say, um, <laughs> where I started. Um, and it's, and it's going to be... It's gonna be what? Berkeley? Uh, Berkeley? Oh, yes, we are going back to Berkeley. Yes, we are going those... <laughs> those bastards! Those bastards. Free speech week turned into free speech 15 minutes, but I showed up like I said I would. I showed up on Sprawl Plaza and screw them. I was there. And Pamela was there with me too. Thank you. 1995, MiloBoutique.com. Um, no, really. Do not allow, to return to a serious subject for a second, I have to close because I, Roger's probably um, 
wondering what the hell I've been doing up here for so long. <laughs> Don't allow the media to separate the Democrat Party from Harvey Weinstein. They're one the same. The same fundraisers, the same parties, the same zip codes, they are the enemies of the American people. They are depraved, self-serving, and evil. And please don't allow the media off the hook for elevating racists up to the position of sinister icons for the worst instincts of a few sad rejects buried deep in their mother's basements. Also, they can then turn around and say that America is experiencing an epidemic of white nationalism whilst at the same time telling the most interesting, popular, handsome, well-dressed... <laughs> I'm, talk I'm talking about myself. <laughs> conservative activists in the country smearing us as things that we are not. Something to bear in mind, by the way, and I'll close with this, just, just in case you know, you're listening on, on YouTube or you're in the hall and you're worried about that BuzzFeed piece. Um, something to bear in mind when you hear bogus charges that I or Trump or my former employers at Breitbart are mainstreaming or normalizing racists in the mainstream media. Here's something to think about. Politico called Richard Spencer a poster boy. Rolling Stone invited their readers to meet him in a piece no right-wing publication would ever have run. Salon said he was sipping chai lattes at the Red Caboose, a train-themed coffee shop, noting his sophisticated demeanor and good grooming. He was, they said, clean-cut and restrained with a tidy appearance. Mother Jones called him dapper and described him having dinner at a Japanese restaurant. The LA Times profile of Spencer was, was glowing with faint criticism, describing his sad band of racist rejects as buttoned-down millennials. The Washington Post described in some detail how Spencer dresses in three-piece Brooks Brothers suits, gold coin cufflinks, and $5,000 Swiss watches. Imagine going out in such cheap shit. It's almost worse than the racism. <laughs> but apparently it impressed somebody at WAPO. <laughs> crap at racism, crap at showing off. Richard Spencer really is the pits. The Atlantic has praised Richard Spencer's good grammar and coherent view of the world. Vice says he's part of an elite, and CNN talks about him all the time. There's a reason they're doing it. Wake up and realize. They want to elevate these weird fringe figures into cultural icons, or at least countercultural icons, so that they can then turn around and say there is an uprising of anti-Semitism and white nationalism in this country, which there simply is not. They just don't like the way the election went. If you're wondering about my descriptions of Richard Spencer, I called him uh, a closet case with man boobs. <laughs> he has returned the favor, writing that no one in the alt-right should support me because I don't share any of their views, which I take as a high compliment. We in this room believe in truth. We are Western supremacists. We will never allow them to make us feel ashamed for proclaiming that the West is the best. Our opponents on the political left are powerful, but they believe in corruption, threats, moral turpitude, conspiracy theories, bullying, and outright lies. These things exist in intricate symbiosis, incapable of survival without the other, like Lena Dunham and ice cream scoops, <laughs> or Ipecac. <laughs> Fingers down the throat time. By the way, I've lost weight recently, surgically, and uh, does anyone else in this hall notice when you get thinner, you start to get colder? You notice that? Just, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. We, we were speculating that Lena Dunham's house must be, um, must be, must be full of ice furniture. <laughs> she, she must live in one of those ice sculpture hotels. <laughs> It's not very funny, but something to think about. Um, <laughs> Hollywood lectures us on the evils of guns from gated communities with armed guards. They pontificate about feminism while covering for the rape of young girls. They talk to us about 
racial politics while putting no black people in their movies. And they criticized capitalism while engorging themselves through dodgy accounting and exploitative contracts. They bully and defame anyone who calls out their excesses, and in that regard, they are exactly like the Democrats. Harvey Weinstein, ladies and gentlemen, is only the first to fall. We are done taking lectures from the most morally bankrupt people in the Western world. Daddy <laughs> has crushed the NFL. And he told the Values Voters Summit, I think today, that he was bringing back Merry Christmas. Yeah. Ending decades of marginalization of Christianity from public life. Video gamers, the humble video gamers, beat the feminist establishment last year. The race baiters of Black Lives Matter are producing no effect whatsoever except black communities in flames. And I, in my own small way, I'm helping too, by beating off college professors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Who writes this shit? And our keynote speaker this evening, <laughs> the great man, Roger Stone. <laughs> our keynote speaker this evening, who is about to humiliate those wankers in Washington who accuse him of whatever it is, that whatever nebulous charges they've come up with to do with Russia. I lied at the beginning of this speech, by the way. I'm not the most terrifying person in America if you're a leftist. Roger is, and you're about to see why. Roger is a, fierce, a fearsome warrior, a brilliant speaker, an author, a master tactician. His new book is fantastic. And without people like him on the side of freedom, freedom will fail. Fortunately, we do have him. Generation Trump, all the libertarians and conservatives who are, who are in this room and elsewhere in the country are beating the left. Don't listen to libertarian or conservative commentators, <coughs> National Review, uh, when, they when they say this battle cannot be won, that Hollywood is too far gone, that college campuses should be abandoned, that the media will never change. These things already are changing. We do have a mountain to climb. It's a huge mountain, but our foothold is secure, and the sun is shining. God bless you all, and thank you.